Um, if you want to get ready as we, as we move along and you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in the book of John at chapter 21. Book of John at chapter 21. Um, and, and we're going to look at Peter's story today. Um, we're in week four of this series, Encounter. And, and for those of you who haven't been here for the other weeks in this series, what, the, this, um, what this message series has been about is uh, we started on Easter. And we've been walking through different times that after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, And before he went to heaven, that people encountered him. Okay, there was a few times there in between when he died on the cross, he was resurrected from the dead, he walked on earth again, and then he went to heaven and he says, I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, he goes to get ready for us to come when we die, if we accept Christ to go to heaven, right? He's getting ready for that. He's getting ready someday at some point to come back and to, and to, and to uh, take, you know, take his people again, right? And all that good stuff that we've, we've learned about and we know a little bit about, even if we don't really go to church, we hear about it, we see the movies about it and stuff, right? Okay, so there was, a, there was a lot of stuff that happened in that time period between when he was resurrected and when he went to heaven. And people encountered Christ. Now, let me remind you what our de- definition for encounter is. An encounter is when we have a face-to-face interaction with someone. I don't mean a distant, long, I'm in a crowd interaction. I don't mean like a, I saw them walking down the street interaction, but an actual face-to-face confrontation whether that be good or bad with a person that's what we mean when we say to have an encounter now over the last couple of weeks i've been sharing with you guys some stories of different fun and, and cool encounters that i have had or i almost had in my life um, over the last few years as, as the kind of kind of the, the give you an example of what i'm talking about today i don't want to share a story about my own encounter i want to actually um, share a story with you about an encounter that my nephew had, Uh, my nephew Tristan. Now Tristan, some of you know Tristan because during the summertime he comes down and and stays with me in Chanda and goes to the lake and stuff. So some of you, you know who Tristan is. If you don't, Tristan is one one of 13 grandkids for my parents. Uh, My parents have 13 grandkids ranging from 18 to my son who is almost four months old. And Tristan is somewhere in between. He's my oldest brother's son, okay? And Tristan spends a lot of time at my parents' house, spends a lot of time um, in the summertime, comes down and stays with me in Shanda, things like that. So a lot of you will get to know him if you don't know him yet. Well, when Tristan was younger, as I said, he spent quite a bit of time at my parents' house, and that included weekends. And, And so he would go to church with my parents. Okay. At that time, um, we went as a family. I believe I was still in high school. Yeah, I was still in high school. And we went as a family to Life Church in Ava. Uh, and at that time, there was a guy named Mike Freeman who was the pastor at Life Church in Ava. And Mike is a good friend of mine who I hope someday you all get to meet. I would love for him to come down to our neck of the woods someday. Mike is a good friend of mine. He was the first pastor I ever had. He was my grandparents' pastor when my, when my grandfather died of cancer. Um, he was our, mine and Shanda's pastor for a long time. He married Shanda and I. Um, that's how, how important he is in our family. And so Tristan would go to church every week with my parents. Well, when he was younger, he was just, you know, like toddler, preschool age, and he was a little more shy, and so he wouldn't go back to the kids' area. So he'd stay and sit with mom and dad in service. So every week, he would watch Mike on stage. Now, let me, let me just tell you kind of physically what Mike looks like. Mike is a very tall man. I would say Mike's probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, Shanda, wouldn't you agree? He's a tall, tall, tall guy. He's a broad guy, okay? He was a, an all-state, uh, I believe, linebacker, outside linebacker, lineman, something of that nature in high school. Okay, he, so he was a decorated football player in high school. He's a big guy, okay? Very big guy. Now, he's, he's slim now. He's not quite as muscular as he was when he was younger, but he's still very healthy, very slim. And, and, and he's, you know, if you didn't know Mike, or if for some reason you managed to catch Mike without a smile on his face because the man's always smiling, um, you might be intimidated by him because he is a little bit of a bigger guy. So you've got this big guy who stands on this stage. And Life Church, their worship center holds about, their, their sanctuary holds about 300 people. So it's quite a bit larger than what we have here, okay? And you've got this big stage and you've got all the lights and the sounds and, and all this stuff. And Tristan watches him every week. Never met him before. Watches, watches him every week. 
listens to this guy who gets up on stage, talks about God, and tells you how to live a good life, and tells you how to do good things, and helps you with your problems, right? And all this stuff that God's supposed to do. Mike is on stage every week talking to people about this, and Tristan is just listening intently. Okay, remind you, he's never met Mike before. One day, Mike comes over to my parents' house on a Sunday afternoon. And Tristan, he's just seen him on stage again at, at church, right? And Mike comes over to my parents' house on Sunday afternoon. It's the summertime, so my parents have the, the front door open. Front door's open, screen door's open, wind's blowing in, it's cooling off the house, right? Tristan's running through the house, chasing, chasing my parents' dog through the house. And Mike comes into the front door. And just imagine this kind of only room lit, you know, no... no actual bulb lighting, just the sunlight coming through the windows in the front door. So it's kind of dim in the house, but it's bright coming through the door. And this six foot three guy who you think stands on stage and tells you how to live a good life, and you're a little kid, comes through the doorway and the light's shining through, like, oh, right? And Tristan's running through the house, stops in the, uh, in the foyer, in, in, the, in the, uh, the, uh, the entryway of the house. He stops. He looks up, his jaw drops, and he has this face-to-face -face encounter for the first time in his life with this big man who he sees on stage every week. Tristan's like two feet tall. And he looks at him and he just goes, Oh my, it's God. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm almost positive Mike looked at him and said something along the lines of, Not even close, buddy. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that Now that is a face-to-face -face encounter. That's what we're talking about here. Now, for the disciples, for, for Jesus' followers, when they had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, they really did look at Him and go, Oh my, it's God. Because this is a guy who had came and claimed to be the Messiah, which means he was supposed to be the teacher, he was supposed to be their, their leader, he was supposed to be the guy who set them free from oppression, who, who destroyed the enemies of God, who, who took the nation who was chosen by God and made them a big deal again and, and released them from their captives, right? And, and so they think this is what that guy's supposed to be, but he comes, the Bible says, as a guy, who, it says that he was so normal looking that there was no physical features about him that would have been noticeable. But something that attracted them to Jesus along the way, right? But they still, over, all the way through it all, they, they thought he was the Messiah. But this whole being God and being a human being thing, okay, that a lot of us, be honest, a lot of us, even Christians, sometimes we struggle with the idea of God being able to be God in heaven, but then being God on earth, but they're not, they're not different, but they're this... I, it's all, it can be a little confusing, right? And so we, even from hindsight, looking back, it goes, how, you know, he is God, he's on earth, but then he prayed to God. And it, it's confusing. And so they've got, they're there. They haven't had 2,000 years to figure it out. They're just there. And, and they choose to follow this guy anyway, saying, I'm not completely sure what he is, but we think he might be something big. So they, they give their life over to this guy, right? And then he dies. And their whole life is torn apart. So when he comes back, and he starts to have face-to-face interactions with these people there's moments like what we're going to see today when you'll hear from peter where they stopped they looked up and they said oh my it's god because jesus proved himself listen jesus is our salvation i could get into the whole big thing of what god the father god the son god the holy spirit all that stuff know this even though we, we have different names for Him according to what He's doing in our lives, we have one God. We have one God who loves us so much that he, he, he endured being a human being, took on our sin, and died so that we could have life. So that we could be forgiven of all the stupid and the ugly and the dirty things that we have done. And He longs to have a face-to-face -face encounter with each and every one of us. Just because He doesn't physically walk the earth, Jesus said He sent what's called the Holy Spirit, which basically is God on earth now. When we, when we feel like God performs miracles, does things in our life, when we feel Him in our heart, our conscience, when, when He tells us to do the right thing, that is God on earth right now. And He wants to talk to us. He wants to have a face-to-face -face encounter with us today. My prayer, before we continue and we look at the story of Peter, is that we will choose again one more week, two more weeks as we finish this series to allow God to have a face 
to face encounter with us. Okay? I want to have a face to face talk with you. Okay? I, I don't want to be up here and I try not to get up here and sometimes maybe I get a little excited or I have a specific statement I want to make, but I don't want to get up here and I don't want to, I don't want to throw you in the dirt all afternoon. I'm not that kind of preacher, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get up here and I'm not going to scare you into getting on your knees at a wooden altar. That's not, I'm not that kind of preacher either. What I want to do is I want to have a talk with you. I want to talk about what Christ wants to do. So today, we're going to look at Peter's story. Um, it, let, let me set the stage just a little bit of who Peter is, okay? Um, as you know, there was, as, as you know, you might know, there, there was 12 disciples, right? And Peter was one of these 12. Now, he was one of the ones that we hear about more and more and more as we read the Bible. We'll learn later in his life, he's one of the leaders of the church, okay? And he is one of the leaders, I mean, one of the top leaders of the early Christian church after Jesus goes back to heaven. But before that, a lot of stuff happens. Okay? Peter was, was an ordinary guy. There was not a whole lot to notice about him either. In fact, I was doing some research on Peter this week. And there were some things that were said about him that it was believed that Peter was actually a, a mid-height, pale man. Okay, he was pale, even being out in the sun. He was a naturally pale guy. Um, from physical descriptions given to people that had, had wrote it down when they encountered him, a lot of people said that he was, like I said, he was, he was a middle-sized guy. He wasn't, he wasn't big. He wasn't small. He was just normal size. He was pale-skinned. They said that he had thin to no eyebrows, and he had like just almost plain brown eyes with maybe just a constant red shot eye tint to them. Okay? So just be honest, almost kind of a little bit of a goofy looking guy. That's, okay? There wasn't a whole lot about Peter that was noticeable either. But something special was in his heart. Okay? Peter has a, a, a bad reputation to him that even I have given him. See, Peter has been labeled a lot of time to be a coward and a wimp. Okay? And, and, and here's why. When Jesus was being crucified... When he was laying down his life for people, just, just a little bit before that, Jesus had said, you guys, you won't be there. You'll leave me. You'll be, you'll be scattered as I'm being crucified. And Peter, who did, he, he was a confident man. And it's good to have confidence in yourself, by the way. You need to have some confidence in ourself. I think one of the lessons we can learn from Peter is we all need to believe in ourselves a little bit. Okay? Believe in your ability to do something. In fact, we're going to talk about that just shortly. So Peter was pretty confident in himself most of the time. But that confidence would transfer over to pride. And the Bible says pride comes before destruction. Okay? And, and Peter had a prideful moment where he said, Jesus, I won't, I won't abandon you. I will never abandon you, no, abandon you no matter what they do. And Jesus looks right at Peter, no, being God, already knowing what's going to happen. He says, Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. In other words, you will pretend like you don't know me for the sake of saving yourself three times before morning. Peter says, oh, no, 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 that, not me. I would never do that. But in the heat of the moment, as Jesus is being beaten, literally beaten, and people say, hey, you're one of his disciples. No, that's not me. I'm not, I don't know who this guy is. No, I've seen you with him before. You're one of his disciples. I've never seen this guy in my life, Peter says. No, I, I, I swear to you, he's one of the guys who follows this Jesus guy we're, that we're killing right now. And Peter, in such anger and frustration and fear for his own life, not only does he deny him a third time, but he cusses at these people as he does this, as he curses them. He says, no, man, I've never seen this guy in my life. And about that time, the rooster crows. And Peter remembers. And so Peter's been given this bad reputation of being a wimp, of being a coward, of being a guy who left Jesus in his most important moments. Let me, let me remind you who this Peter is. This is the Peter who, although he got scared and had some faults to him, was bold enough to step out on a boat and believe that he could walk on water. Okay, This is the Peter who always was the front man. He was basically like the, the, he was the big guy. He was the, the security guard. He was the one willing to be bold. He reminds me a lot 
of, and I'm not the, not, not in the pale skin and the thin eyebrows and the kind of the goofy nature of explaining, but he reminds me a lot of, of a friend of, of mine that many of you know, Jeff Alcorn, in terms of he's not the biggest guy in the world, but you don't want to mess with him, okay? And Jeff is a good friend and he's a nice guy, but dude, if you mess with people he loves, he's going to get at you. Jeff was a, was a, a, a respected, athlete in high school too and he could hit harder than the six foot three guys okay and he's he's shorter than i am okay that's the kind of guy peter was peter was bold he was brave yes he screwed up and we all screw up just remember that we all screw up he was a human being but he was a brave guy he was so brave and so bold that there was a day that when he said that he, when he when Jesus asked who do you say I am he said that, he said that you're the messiah you're our savior you're our king and Jesus said this is the rock on which my church will be built and so Peter was such a bold strong-willed man that Jesus claimed him as the foundation of the beginning of his church Peter was the foundation as a human being the leader that has led us to where we are today without him we wouldn't be here. So I, I want us to put aside that misconception of Peter being a coward and understand he was a human being with some faults. And we're going to look at his story. We're going to look at, at, at his encounter, his personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with Jesus. And we're in, in the book of John, uh, chapter, 20, chapter 21, and we're going to look at the first 17 verses. And we're going to walk through this really quick, and we're going to learn some, a few things from it as we go. In the book of John, chapter 21, uh, verse 1. And there's some really cool stuff about this. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples besides the sea, beside the Sea of Galilee. Galilee. Now, Jesus has been resurrected. A few weeks ago, we talked about Mary Magdalene's encounter with Christ and how people didn't believe her. And we talked about the struggles of being alone and the things we know that are true. Okay. Last week, we talked about the about Thomas and how Thomas doubted. And, how, and what it means to, to have faith and how it's okay to doubt and to ask questions and to try to find answers just like Thomas did. All of that stuff has happened. Okay? And it says Jesus appears again, again to them at the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, which is the Peter we've been talking about. Thomas, nicknamed the twin. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and, the, and two other disciples. Okay? Now, really quick, I want you to remember, Peter at this point has dedicated his whole life to Christ. So has all of these other guys. And even though Christ has, has reappeared, He has proved to them that he's, He is resurrected from the dead, He hasn't really done a whole lot. He's come to them and He's talked to him a few times. He's appeared to Mary. He's appeared to Thomas. He's taught him some specific lessons. But He hasn't done at this point any of the stuff He would do in the future. Any of the, when he would, he would give them the declaration to go and preach the Gospel to all nations. When the Holy Spirit would come. All of that cool stuff. None of that has happened. So they've seen Him a few times. But as far as they know, or as far as Peter is concerned, it's really still over. They can be happy that Jesus is alive again. But it's never going to be as good as it was in the glory days. Let me ask you this. You ever long for the glory days? For the best part of your life? For the highest points in your life? Maybe for some of you that was high school. Uh, my senior year in high school is one of my glory days, man. It was, it was great. And sometimes I miss that. I miss being back in high school. Now, I'd never give up my life now. But sometimes, let's be honest, you miss those things. Or maybe you're a Christ follower and you had that, that moment in your life where you gave your life to Christ and how big and impactful and how excited you were. Or maybe you went on a retreat or you went to a certain event or a certain worship service or something. There was a, a feeling that you had and that's a glory day for you. You want that feeling back. You want to be that person again. Peter wanted the glory days. He wanted to go back to before Jesus was arrested, captive, and, and crucified. He wanted the days where everything was awesome and people were being healed and, and the thousands and thousands were following and they were like superstars in their own backyard, right? They were, they were in, the, in, in the public eye for some good reasons. And that was the glory days. The glory days were over. And even though Jesus was back, Peter felt like it's over. So what do you do when, you, when you've kind of, let's say you went on vacation or you've kind of veered this direction and you've, you've done some different stuff in your life or maybe you had a long 
took a couple days off and you had a long four day weekend and you had a lot of fun and you, you did a lot of exciting stuff and you went to wherever you went. What do you do when Monday rolls back around? You go to work, right? The fun's over. The glory days are over. It's time to go to work. So what did Peter do? Well, the glory days are over. The extended weekend's done. So it's time for me to go back to work. And at verse 3 says, Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Now, he's not saying, I'm taking one more day off and I'm hitting the lake. No, Peter was a commercial fisherman. This is what he did for a living. He went fishing. This is how he made a livelihood. We know from historical fact that Peter had a wife. There's chances that he had a kid. Okay? So he had a job. I have to go back to my job. I need to go back to providing for my family. I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. So we understand that Peter is a normal man struggling with the same things we struggle with. Struggling with the longing for the glory days or the big moments or the, or the mountaintops in our lives. Struggling to provide for the balance, providing for his family and following God. Struggling with understanding exactly what's going on in our life in the difficult times, right? Peter is a normal guy. He's back out on his boat. He's with his disciples. They are fishing. And here is where it gets interesting. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul the net because there was so many fish. Then the, disciples, the, the, the disciple Jesus loved, which was John, um, John who is actually writing the book of John we're reading right now, said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, that it was Jesus, he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work jumped into the water and headed the shore. Now, let, let, me, let me say something about that right there. He put, he put his tunic on, which means he put his robe on. In other words, he had taken off his robe, his main clothing, because he had gotten hot, he was getting sweaty and dirty, and he was working. Now, this, you know, have you ever, men, the whole, women, please don't raise your hand to this, okay? But men, have you ever like been mowing the yard or working outside or maybe you did manual labor and it gets hot and what do you do? You pull your shirt off or maybe you wore layers because it was cold that morning and what did you do? You took off your over shirt, right? And you got down to where it was a cooler la layer or maybe you took your shirt completely off, okay? That's where Peter's at today. Now let's say you're out on a boat and you've done this. Let's say you're fishing out on the lake. You've gotten hot, you're in your trunks, you pull your shirt off, right? And then you see someone on shore that you're so excited about, you, you've got to get to them. So you jump in the water and you, you swim the shore to get to these people. Now let me ask you this. If your shirt's already off and you took it off because you were hot, you didn't want your shirt to get sweaty, you didn't want it to get dirty, okay? would you put it back on before you dove into the water? Is that, is that not just a goofy? That's pretty much what Paul has done here. He's so excited that he sees Jesus, that he's not thinking straight. And he puts his clothes back on and then dives into the water and gets them wet. That, that makes no sense to me. But he's, he's, he's not thinking. He doesn't care. All he wants to do is he wants to get to Jesus. So Peter jumps in the water and he swims the shore. The others stay with the boat and they pull the loaded net to the shore for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal file, fire and some bread. Bring some of your fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, listen to this. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon, how much do you love me? Do you feel like you love me more than all the other people? Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Hmm. Jesus, re Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. 
And the third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? If someone asks you, do you love me? And they ask you three times, wouldn't you get a little upset, right? Okay, Peter feels like, even though he messed up, that he's proved his love to, to, to him, okay? Sometimes, when, back when Shanda and I was dating, she would, she would say, do you love me? Well, yeah, I love you. I tell you I love, me, love you all the time, right? And it would frustrate me. Why, why are you asking me? Of course I love you. What would make you doubt that I loved you? But I, I come to know over time, men, you understand this, listen to women, okay? They kind of know what they're doing sometimes. They kind of know how they feel. And I learned over time that the reason she was asking me, do you love me, wasn't because she wanted me to say I love you. It's because she wanted me to show her that I loved her. Jesus was at this point where, where, where Peter had denied him. Peter hadn't been showing Jesus much love. And he's asked him three times, do you love me? And all three times. See, Peter says this on the third time. Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Three times, do you love me? Yes. Three, three times he answers a, an, with an answer that is, that is almost the same. Take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? There's a few things I want us to learn from Peter right here. And, and, and I believe that, that as Peter went along in his life, and as Jesus talked to him some more and prepared him for the future, and as Peter progressed through his life, he began to learn three different points that Jesus was trying to teach him in this moment. And I want us to learn from Peter's long term. He had to learn it over time. He had to learn it from experience. I want us to learn it today. There's three different things I want us to understand that Jesus taught Peter at this point that I believe he is trying to teach us today. And the first thing is this. We are responsible for more than just ourselves. If you're following along in your worship guys today, that will be your first fill-in. We are responsible for more than just us. For more than just ourselves, okay? This world is a little bit bigger than our bubble, okay? If you are old enough to start making your own decisions, whether you're in middle school or you're in your 90s, there is a very likely chance that someone is looking up to you or they're looking at you or they are watching you. And what you do might decide what they do. Three times Jesus says, feed my sheep. He says it in three different ways. He says, I'm going to, I'm, don't, you don't have to bring it back up on the screen, but I'm going to read it again. He says this, he says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Then feed my lambs. What are the lambs? The lambs are the helpless ones, right? They are the babies. They are the immature ones. Guys, some of us were parents. Okay? I'm a, I'm a new dad. Four months. And I can already see my son looking up to me at four months old. He's staring at me right now like, why is he up there? He should be playing with me. Now, now he's looking away. Good job, son. Every time I show you off. Yesterday, after I got off work at the restaurant, I came down here because I had some stuff I still needed to get done before today. And I call Shanda, or Shanda calls me, and we're talking on the phone. And, and she starts saying, Caleb, can you hear your daddy? Can you hear your daddy? And she's like, he's not doing anything. So we'll put the, put the phone on speaker. And let me talk to him. And I start talking. Caleb, Caleb. I'm saying his name and now he is staring at me. Caleb, Caleb. Hey, daddy's here. And the kid just starts bursting out in laughter. He's like, what in the world is going on here? How is my dad's voice coming through this little screen that I stare at when mom's playing her games? You know, I mean, what is what 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 in the world is going on? And he is just laughing his head off and screaming and just it's it was the coolest thing and i realized that was a point last night where i stopped and i realized the love that my son has for me and i and, and it was one of those sinking moments where where i was reminded of this statement that i was told and that is um i had a, i had a guy who when he found out my wife was pregnant when he found out shanda was pregnant he looked at me and he said man get ready because for the next at least the next 10 years before they become too cool for you you will be your kid's superhero. And I was reminded of that. Because a superhero is someone we look up to. It's someone who saves the day. It's someone who, who swoops in and gets us when we're falling. It's someone who we can look to on how to live a life. It's someone who is 
cool and 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 and, and someone we can that we can uh, have in our lives that we can say, hey, that's someone I want to be like. And you are responsible for more than this, just yourself, men. As dads, we are responsible to represent God. Women, as mothers, we are responsible to raise our kids up to be respectful people and the love and, the, and, and to be good in this world. But not just if we're parents. Maybe it's in your job. Maybe you're a supervisor. Or maybe you're the, the, the person who, who has the level head in a place where there's not a lot of level heads. Or maybe you just have people in your life who you've been helping or, or who, who just look at you and you know that they're watching you. Listen, you're responsible for them. You are responsible for how you represent God. You are responsible for how you live your life. No matter your age, I can guarantee you there is someone who is looking at you. Teenagers, these little kids, my son, the twins, Kylie, the, the kids back there in that class right now, they're looking up to you, teenagers. They're looking at you. Where you're at, no matter whether you're sitting in a pew right now, a pew, a chair, when you're at work, when you're at school, when you're hanging with your friends, no matter your beliefs, whether you're a Christian or not, the way you live your life, there are people who are watching you. And they're looking to you. What kind of example are we going to set? Adults, what kind of examples are we setting for the teenagers? When we tell them how to live their lives, but we don't live it ourselves, right? They're watching us. They're watching how we react. They're watching our anger. They're watching our attitudes to see what we do. Because they see us as the acceptable way of doing things. This is how the world runs. Because they're the adults. And that's what it's going to be like someday. Listen to this. Listen to what the Bible has to say here. In the book of Matthew, chapter 25, at verse 40, it says, And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Jesus just explained this whole story about how you visited people in prison and you showed people my love and you took care of the orphans and the widows and you did all this good stuff and stuff and and you represented me well. When the people who were looking up to you, they were looking to you to set the example, you did a good job with setting that example. And because of that, I know you. Because why? Because what you did among the least of these you were doing to me as Christ. In other words, Christ says, I take what you do very personally. Because the people that are looking up to you, whether you believe in me or not, the people that are looking up to you, they matter to me. They matter to Jesus. They're my, my, my brothers, my sisters, my kids, my creation. And the way you treat them matters to me. And I want to know that you are, are treating them correctly and you are setting an example for how they live. Listen, guys, if, you are, if you're out there today and you, and you do believe in Christ, I want you to understand this. You will have to answer, the Bible says, for every word you say. You will have to answer for the way you treat people. You will have to answer for how you raised your kids, for, for how you treated your spouse. Now, can God, will God forgive you for the wrong things you've done? Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But you will still have to talk about them. And if you aren't forgiven, or even if you, if you choose not to make the changes you know God wants to make, or you choose not to be someone who's feeding the lambs when you should be, you will have to answer to the consequences for what you did. And if we are Christ followers, if you're here today and you believe in Christ, then your goal should be that I want to set an example of showing Christ well to other people. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of the people that I love. Jesus was the ultimate shepherd, the Bible says. He was the shepherd of shepherds. He was the leader. He is the leader of all the world. He loves every person on this earth. They are His sheep, whether they choose to run off the cliff or not. They are still Jesus' sheep. And the shepherd loves all of His sheep. And He's looking at us saying, feed them, take care of the people that I love. The second thing we learn from this, that P Peter learns, and I'm going to try to move on very quickly here. The second thing we learn that Peter learned here is the love of Christ is unconditional. Peter had denied Jesus three times 
in literally just a couple of hours? Have you feel like you have some days where you screw up so bad that there's no returning? And just in a 24-hour period, you manage to do so much stupid stuff that you feel like you can never go back. You can never be forgiven. You can never make up for it. Some days we have, sometimes we have days or weeks or months in our lives that are just, they just straight up stink. And we screw up all the time and we think, there's no return from this. I can never make up for this. Listen, this is a guy who said, I am 100% committed to you, Christ, and then denied Jesus three times. Let me tell you what that's called. That's called a relapse, okay? If you're struggling today with an addiction, a hang-up, a habit, and you do that and you relapse, that's okay. We are human beings. We are imperfect. We are broken people, okay? I have messed up this week. We all have. But the love of Jesus is unconditional. It says that no matter what we've done, it says that no matter how far we've gone, it says no matter the life we've lived on every other day besides today, that today is a new day. And Christ will forgive you. Christ still loves you. And He still wants to be in your life. The Bible says this. In the book of Romans, at chapter 8, and this is the Living Bible Translation, this is a very simple way of saying this. I thought I said it very well. It says, But despite all this, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us enough to die for us. For I am convinced that nothing can separate us from His love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels won't. And all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will be able to separate us from the love, of, the love God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when He died for us. Listen, you are never too far from God. Peter denied Christ three times. And Jesus said, you did not stop being the rock, the foundation, the level-headed man who I would use to lead the church in the future. You would not stop being the person who I have given a purpose to and who I love and who I have forgiven. Which leads us to our third thing that Peter learned that I want you to know today. We all have a purpose. Jeremiah 39 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. You will find me when you seek me, if you look for me in earnest. Yes, says the Lord, I will be found by you, and I will end your slavery and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you back home again to your own land. I know the plans I have for you. Listen, today, maybe you're wondering where you're going next. Maybe you're at a place where you have to, you have to make some big decisions in your life. Teenagers, maybe you're at the place where you're starting to think about college. Or you're starting to think about relationships. Or you're starting to think about what's... What's left after high school? Because I tell you, high school ends. And it ends a lot quicker than you think. And, and, and when it ends, life begins in a completely new way. And maybe you feel lost today. Maybe you're at a place where you, you've had something happen in your life just recently. You've had a struggle in your life. Or you're currently in the middle of a struggle or, or, or a conflict in your life. Or you're having to make some big decisions and make a lot of big sacrifices and you're trying to figure out which dress direction to go. Let me tell you today, we all have a purpose in this world. As long as you still have a pulse, as long as you don't drop over dead as you stand up today, God has a purpose for you. He will still use you. But he's, as He says here in Jeremiah, He wants to bring you out of your slavery. He wants to get you past your past. He wants to get you past your conflicts and your addictions and your problems. He wants to direct your life. He has a plan for you that is greater than anything we can come up with. A lot of people think that this, there's this Christian word called that, that you just called. There's a, a very Christianese word that, that some of you might have heard called anointed. Oh, that person's anointed, right? Let me tell you what anointed means. 
To be anointed means that God has planned it for you. That's what it means. That God has given you a purpose. That He has a plan. And when you are anointed, it means that you are doing what He has created you to do. That doesn't mean that you have to get up on a stage and you have to be a preacher or you have to sing music or you have to do this and, and that. God has planned for some people to be accountants and some people to be veterinarians and some people to be doctors and some people to be professional football players and some people to be, you know, whatever it is that you're wanting to do with your life. God might have anointed you to do that, planned your life out to be that way, and not just to do it, but to do it with excellence and do it in a way that brings Him glory and do it in a way where people will go, wow, that's a person that I can look up to. Wow, they've got a level head on their shoulders. Wow, they have got this figured out. And you can say, no, I don't have this figured out. God has this figured out. And He's the one who's brought me here. See, Peter later would preach to thousands of people. And after the Holy Spirit came and, and it says that the, that the power of God was so awesome that everybody who was at this one place at this one time heard the Word of God spoken in their own languages. And there was people with multiple different languages there. And they all heard the Word of God spoke from the same people in their own language. And people said, they're drunk. They're trickery. This is witchcraft. And, 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 and Peter was the one who stood up both to the naysayers and to the ones who were saying, wow, look how good the disciples are. And he said, no, 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 no. This is not us. This is God. Because God had a plan for us. And because we chose to follow God's plan for us, we are successful. Because we accepted the unconditional love of Christ we are able to do something with our lives. God has purpose for you. God has people He wants you to be an influence on. And God has a place He wants you to go. One place we're all going. Okay, We're all going out of these doors. We're all going into this world. And as fun as it can be on Sunday mornings and as... as, as as, uh, as great as it is to, to come to a place with no stress, when we go back out there, the world hits again. And what we have to decide is who we're following and who's leading us as we lead other people. Because no matter who you are and what you believe, you're leading other people whether you like it or not. My prayer today is that you will choose to follow God. My prayer today is that when you choose both to do positive things in the people's life or you choose to be negative, and I'll be honest, some of us today, we have times during our week, and I'm included, where we choose to be negative, whether it's in a small way or a big way, on purpose. Whether we're angry, we're upset, or we just don't care, or that's just how we like it, we choose to be negative people. And that negativity is going to come back on us. When we leave here, we have to choose what we're going to do. We're going to have to choose how we're going to represent our lives. Whether you choose to, to take Christ with you or not, you have to choose what you're going to do. My prayer today is that you will choose God. And you will let Him lead you. Okay, Let's pray. Father, thank You so much. Thank You so much for...